Today's message, Why Jesus Came, is a continuation of the sermon we began two weeks ago, and uh, in which, in rapid fire, uh, we looked at the answers Jesus gave. When people would ask him the purpose of his mission, he, he gave them nine different reasons why he came. And we spoke last week in particular that he came to reveal the Father. He came to uh, wipe away all the, the kind of um, misapprehensions people had of, of God, to cut through uh, the uh, fog of tradition and, and how that tended to blur the reality of God. And to reveal the true theology of God, he came as God in the flesh. And um, so in telling about this saving truth, uh, of course, he, he had some things that were easy to say and that people received readily and other things went against their expectations and they either didn't understand him or they opposed him for those things. But he came to announce the appearance of the kingdom of God, that God was at work on earth and he was beginning a spiritual kingdom that was to culminate in um, the actual coronation of Jesus as King and Kings and Lord of Lords someday in the future. But in the meantime, Jesus was founding a spiritual kingdom and that all who listened were invited to become a part of that kingdom. That was one of his main reasons because over 50 times he spoke of this and he spoke of it not only to its reality, but to the surprising nature of it because the anticipated messianic kingdom was to be very material to most of his Jewish listeners. They thought he was coming to overthrow the Roman rule and to inaugurate um, a throne there in Jerusalem and may become uh, the capital of the world, etc. And so they were uh, harboring a lot of fond ambitions of grandeur that spoke to who they were and who their lineage was as a people. And uh, Jesus was needing to break it to them gently that that was not why he came to earth. And uh, we're going to cover three more reasons. Uh, the rest of those nine, you'll have to go back and, and look at that uh, streaming video that's available, um, that you can find those and preach all the other four reasons to yourself. Look up the, the uh, information in scripture as I gave it. But today we're going to look at the one of three. This was the fifth on that list of nine, but it's the first we're going to look at today. Uh, Jesus said, uh, don't think I came to bring peace. I came to bring division, not unity. Division, not peace. Um, and that presents an enigma, a uh, paradox. Why would the Prince of Peace declare that he came to create discord and division? Maybe you've processed already. Maybe that's not an issue for you. But for those listening, that was a bit of, uh, left them in a quandary. So here's his words in Matthew 10. We read them from uh, the pulpit earlier. Uh, thank you, Randy. And now we'll say it again. Do not think I've come to bring peace on the earth. I'm not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. You see, wherever an uncomfortable truth gets told, an uncomfortable truth, a difficult to understand and a popular truth, a truth that goes against the grain of expectation, a truth that tells a secret the family doesn't want to get out. Whenever an uncomfortable truth gets told, a chain of consequences gets set in motion. On the one hand, you have those who accept the message and the messenger, and they laud them for their courage, and they, they look at that truth, and they begin to absorb what it means in the change of attitudes and behaviors and response, and they move in that direction of accepting that message as truth and as something they needed to relate to, where others reject the messenger, reject that truth, and uh, also that leads them on a a sequence of predetermined consequences 
spelled out first by their rejection. They didn't listen. They said no. They didn't want to accept it. And so the, the fact remains is that Jesus wanted to uh, distill in their hearts and minds with as much clarity as he could, with as much conviction as is possible for heaven to bring to earth, the kingdom of God is revolutionary. It's revolutionary. It's going to be a whole new idea. It'll bring about a whole new age. Choosing the way of the cross means to abandon worldly aims and earthly satisfactions. And that doesn't come easily, it doesn't come naturally, and for some people it never comes at all. But that's not where we're going with today's message because for many people they do accept the way of the cross. But as your personal growth uh, in this new pathway of accepting of truth grows distinctly different from the worldling's path, that separation would cause a response from those who have not chosen to enter the kingdom of They don't want a journey with you. They don't want to come to a church meeting. They'll go to a dance. They'll go bowling. They'll go shoot pool. They'll do any number of things with you, but they don't come to church. And if, as you prioritize those kind of spiritual events in your life more and more, they distance themselves more and more from you psychologically. And sometimes they even replace their former affections toward you with their frustration and with their animosity, with their anger, they blame you for everything that's going wrong in their life. And um, that form of love turns to actually uh, palpable. You can sense it, uh, a sense of the opposite of love. And the opposite of love is not nonchalance or not caring. The opposite of love is the fire of hatred. They begin to despise you. They begin to hold uh, grudges and they become bitter toward you and uh, the warmth of acceptance of you is replaced by the chill of rejection. Now in the extreme, Jesus foretold that outright murder becomes rationalized to silence the witness uh, that your conscience while you're alive is making against their own absence of virtue. Like Cain, they see the only way to silence that rebuke from God about their life is to kill you. And that has happened before. Um, I have a personal friend. He's my dentist. Uh, he grew up in uh, Sri Lanka. And when his childhood friend was wanting to get baptized, his dad told him, if you do it, I'll kill you. He thought it was a bluff. And so he went and got baptized. And he went at home and his dad was working in the jungle, clearing the jungle with a machete. And he said, Dad, I come to tell you, I went ahead and I got baptized because Jesus is my savior. And he took that machete and right in front of my friend, he killed his son in cold blood. See, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Truth that's not welcomed is hated. And so Jesus said, walk in the light while it's day, lest it become darkness to you. I'll never forget. I'd only been in, in ministry four years. And I was new in this pastorate in a little country church. There was a little country crossroads called Branch. And what everybody remembered Branch for was it was right there in the middle of the Ozarks of Missouri. It was a town that struggled to keep a new car for its police chief, so they had a speed trap. And everybody knew about Branch as a speed trap. That's the one thing they just, when you go through there, make sure you're going three miles under the limit because they'll stretch the truth and they'll find a way to pull you over. Well, here I am preaching in the Branch Seventh-day Adventist Church that morning. And a, a handsome young man walked through the door right as the church was beginning. And I was impressed by the Holy Spirit to draw a little attention to that because, you know, there are no accidents when it comes to spiritual realities. Nobody accidentally finds themselves in church. It's always a providence. The Holy Spirit is calling people every Sabbath, and it's a miracle when they actually come to church. And so I centered on this young man, and I knew that the Holy Spirit had called him there. And I impressed upon him with just a few words because I had another sermon. But the idea was that when God impresses you to do something, you need to act upon it. Otherwise, it'll go away and, and you may lose out forever on that blessing he wants to bring into your life. 
So at the close of the worship hour, all the worshipers were filing past, shaking a hand, and uh, many of them saying similar things like, I enjoyed the sermon, pastor, things like that. And here comes this new person to me, and he introduced himself, and I'm not going to give you his real name, but it's something sort of close to his name. His name was Mike Manning. He says, now, about three years ago, he says, my wife and I attended some evangelistic meetings nearby. And we almost joined then, but my wife's parents objected. Uh, they did not want us to join the Adventist church. And so my wife drew back. She wanted to keep her parents happy. But she says, I've been hoping and praying that my wife would mellow out a little bit and at least come with me to church. Well, she has refused, so the Lord has impressed me. This is his confession to me. The Lord has impressed me that I need to set an example for my family. Was he right? Absolutely. God is looking for men who are as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. Men will do what's right. Men will be the, the priests of their household. Men will lead their family in spiritual matters. So he said, come visit my family. So I, I went to his home because he wanted to be baptized. And as I met with him and his wife in the living room, I saw the situation was significantly more adversarial than he had first stated. And after confirming he was going to go ahead with the baptism, she looked at him coldly. And, and sometimes, you know, you, you can see love and affection in people's eyes. Other times you can see the opposite. Yeah, she looked at him coldly. And she said to him, I'll get you for this. Well, when someone who is in your bosom says, I'm going to get you for this, you better listen up because um, there was something about the way she said it that meant she was going to do something. And then she turned to me with that same cold look and she said, you're a dead man. Well, I'm in the middle of Missouri. You know, there's a lot of country out there a lot of people having guns and things and then she said I'm going to be there to make sure he doesn't get baptized so I didn't know what kind of kerfuffle what kind of uh, thing would blow up in front of me but we planned the baptism anyway and, the, and uh, it was a week or so later that, that morning she was there and she met my welcome I welcomed her cordially I welcomed her into the house of God and I trusted that she would find a connection with a loving Jesus and a loving God there, but she said nothing. She just uh, went right by me. And uh, at that moment, because she had a rather big purse, and I thought, what's in that purse? She said I was a dead man. And for just an instant, I wished I had a tactical vest, you know, like the SWAT guys get to wear. I wished I had one of those. And I thought, no, you know, uh, my armor is the armor of God. That's what the Holy Spirit has said, that uh, my armor is. And so even if I'm martyred for doing the right thing, uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm on God's time and doing God's errand. And I'm going to trust God for the success of his kingdom uh, efforts. Well, the baptism went off without a hitch, except that I knew that she was standing at the very back with cold eyes watching every gesture and uh, she walked out as soon as he was baptized she saw that it was a reality she didn't want to talk with anybody she, i watched her leave the building and afterwards she was as good as her word she made her husband mike's life as close to hell as she could make it it was one thing after another one day after another and he lasted several weeks she even came to church a couple times after his baptism but then came the day that she pulled the trump card, the one that would work. She said, if you could go into that church, I'm going to divorce you and sue for exclusive custody of our two children. Well, this man loved his family. He was struggling with his relationship with his wife, but he loved his family. He was committed to God. He was, and so he talked to me and he said, look, I believe this is, as much as ever I want you to pray for me. He says, but I won't be able to come to church for a while till my wife cools off on this idea because I need to keep my family together. Now, that was his decision. 
I need to keep my family together. Now, he knew the gospel story that there would come divisions in the family. And I'm not going to say he did the wrong thing by trying to keep his family together and to quit coming to church. Because he said, I still believe everything I confess to in my baptism. I just am not going to keep irritating my wife by coming back here. Uh, and I said, I will be praying for your brother. And that's the last contact I had with him. But it told me something in my heart that when Jesus said he came to bring division, it often would be very dramatic. And often would be that friends, family members would become enemies over sides taken in the war between spiritual truth and falsehood. And formerly close members would all, family members would often be pitted against one another, even betraying family members to death over the issue of who's going to walk in the truth. Now, I learned something else about this kind of division that Jesus said, that as you work for the kingdom of God, not everybody's going to like it. In fact, some people are going to hate it, and it can even get you arrested and beaten. Remember Peter and John? They hadn't had a regular payday since Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. They hadn't caught any fish. They'd caught some men, and there were donations and things like that, but they couldn't say they had had a payday. And yet they couldn't remember three and a half years where life had been more rich with meaning and been more fulfilling. Working for the kingdom of God had riches that weren't calculatable in earthly terms. Um, and so on this day, they're going to the temple and there is a beggar and he's asking for alms from those who had something because he had nothing. And they looked and they said, we need to help this guy. And they said, but we don't have any money. And so Peter says, look at me. He says, we don't have any money. That's what you're asking for. But here's what we do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, you rise up and walk and you won't need a beg ever again. And he felt a charge of energy and go through his muscles. He stood up and walked. And for using the name of Jesus while performing this act of compassion, Peter and John were arrested and flogged for daring to use the name of Jesus in public ministry. You see, in some places, it's very true that if the things we do are known to be done in the name of Jesus, uh, we would be punished for them. And some places, even to the point of death. It's still that way on this earth. There are still people who are at enmity with the kingdom of God. And so the division Jesus came, which he confessed to be a part of, is very real. We need to acknowledge it. And but we want to understand why is that division? Is it necessary? If the, if the Prince of Pre Peace had ordained this, what is its uh, utilitarian value? Well, this division is going to be used to make transparent God's justice in the final judgment of one's life record. How do you know who deserves heaven and who doesn't? Well, Jesus told a story, a parable of the judgment. He says in the last days that it's going to be just like a shepherd and he's going to sort out his livestock and some are going to be called sheep and they're going to go into a fold of safety and some are going to be called goats and they're not going to be allowed in with the sheep. And so I always have said that as a pastor, God has never called me to judge who's a sheep and who's a goat. But he has asked me to keep the lambs safe from the rams. That in the church of God, we should be nice to one another, be kind to one another. And those who are at the most vulnerable need to be protected from those who are most likely to not have the spirit of Jesus in them. Well, the sec second point we're going to make, we've got to move through this one a little quicker than the first one, to save lives. Um, you see, we think that's from our perspective with the, the cross in our rearview mirror and we, we see all that with clarity. We wonder why it was that Jesus had to belabor the point he came to save lives because there was an objection among many of his listeners because they had competing expectations of life goals for Jesus to accomplish and saving lives wasn't on their list, but it was on Jesus' list. 
And so we find that Jesus had to say, the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. That's Matthew's account. Luke tells it just slightly different, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And they're about the same. But I'm left asking this question, are you sure you know who are the saved and who are the lost? Who are the lost that Jesus came to save? Well, permit me to suggest some answers. To me, to be lost means the opposite from being found. Uh, it means the opposite from being saved. To be among the lost means to be caught outside the kingdom of God looking in. To be lost means to be trapped inside Satan's prison house of addictive vice looking out, wishing you could escape. Whether you realize or not, bad habits have secretly stolen your heart away from any life-changing desire for holiness. You'd rather have your bad habits than actually have holiness. To be lost means to be enviously looking over to where the grass, as you see it, is greener than yours. To be lost means to be registered as a sinner when paradise is going to be reserved for the holy. To be lost is to never to be ready to make a wholehearted commitment of consecration to live as a trusted and trusting friend of God. You look at it with, with oh, I wish I could, but I can't. To be lost is not to know if your name is registered in the Lamb's Book of Life. To be lost is to once been listed in the Lamb's Book of Life, but in the final judgment have your name removed as one who never overcame sin, though it was promised. And it was available through the indwelling of this Holy Spirit of God. Finally, to be lost means you never had a saving encounter with Jesus. Hasn't happened yet for you. You've heard his name, but you've never had a connection with Jesus that changes you, gives you your new birth experience for Jesus came to seek out and save those who are among the lost. Jesus knew that people would struggle with the idea of lostness. So one day he told a crescendoing story of three, three stories in one. There are three parables. He talks about a lost sheep and how at the end of the day, the shepherd is counting his sheep and he, he had 100, but at the end of the day, he had 99. What does he do? He puts the 99 in their sheepfold and instead of eating supper, instead of going to bed, he goes out to find the one that's lost. And then when he finds them, is he angry? Does he mistreat that sheep? He's aware of imperfect imprinting and he realizes that what the sheep did, he did it because he was a stupid sheep. He was an ignorant sheep. He wasn't a rebellious sheep. He was simply ignorant. And so he rescues the sheep from his ignorance and the consequences of his ignorance and he carries them back. And as he comes back into where other shepherds are there, he says, rejoice with me. I'm happy. You be happy with me too, because the one that was lost, I found, because among shepherds, one of the greatest tragedies is to lose your sheep. And he found his sheep, and he asked them to join him with joy. So I've always wondered uh, if you have ever prayed that Jesus would save you from your own ignorance, save you, own, you from your own lack of wisdom concerning where spiritual safety is and move your life from a risky place to a safe place. Well, he tells another story about a, a woman, an industrious woman. He's, she's going about her day and suddenly she finds a, a very precious coin, a very valuable coin, perhaps solid gold. And it was meant to be like a savings account and it's gone. She's misplaced it and she doesn't know if it's been stolen or if she's lost it. And so she stops everything else she was going to do that day and she says, I must find my coin. And she just unearths everything. She looks in every pot, every, every uh, box, everything that is there. She has a dirt floor, and so she sweeps the dirt floor in case a layer of dust is hiding that. And at length, her diligence pays off, and she finds her coin. And she, once again, there is this celebration of the finding of the loss with joy. And she asks all her neighbors to rejoice. Now, the woman in the story is not God, but it's every one of us. And we can get so wrapped up in life's urgencies that we fail at prioritizing the things of, our great, of the greatest value in our life and we have to redirect the, our behavior, redirect our priorities for some time in order to find our life sorting itself out to where everything important is, uh, we're aware of where it is. And so inattention is the cause of this lostness. Uh, not anything evil except just a misdirected attention and Jesus is asking us 
to make sure that our own inattention to spiritual realities doesn't create a situation of lostness for us. My first day in ministry, well, first week in ministry, I had to drive by the golf course to get to my church, and I'm driving by to get to church, and it was one of those first spiritual lessons that dawned on me. I'm going to church, and there are people wading in the tall grass, which we have, you know, the short rough, and then we have the long rough, which is along the, the boundaries, and some people's golf shots don't hit the fairway. They don't even make the short rough. They go way off out of bounds. And I thought about how people's behavior, their out of bounds behavior leads them to lose that tool of, of life that is their game, it's their joy. And I watched these men, grown men, and you know, they, they have fancy new cars. Some of them were parked in, in, the, in the golf course with Cadillacs and Mercedes, but they're out there and they're asking their friends to help them find a lost golf ball. Come on, a golf ball is what, three, four, five dollars, no more than that. Even the best golf for is, was, is not that. But they're spending time looking for something that is valuable to them, and they don't mind that other people are watching them looking for the lost. I thought about that. They even ask others to help them look for their own lost golf ball. And I thought about how Jesus is asking you and me to help him look for lost souls to go out in the highways and the byways, to find the lost however we can, and rescue them and, and give them an invitation to join the kingdom of God. And so I, I just have, this is my own, and it's not time only, but time is one way we can determine dedication to a task. And so I just put this down as a little, uh, what shall we say, an audit, a spiritual audit, if we take that today. How many hours a week, month or year, do I, do you devote? to helping Jesus seek and save the lost? It's a question, and it demands an honest answer. Well, then the, the, this, the third story is the escalation. This one really has a bite to it. Um, not an easy one to listen to, if you understand where Jesus is going with it, because it's a family that's lost. And by turns, the father is in danger of losing a son. The younger son is in danger of losing his connection to his father. And ultimately, at the end of it, the older son, who has been there all along, is in danger of losing connection to his father's priorities in life. And we say that those dangers are because there's an underappreciation. The son underappreciated his father, and he went off the, the uh, oldest son now, as Jesus ends the story, the father has got back the lost son, but now he's in danger of losing the son who had been there because his older son is saying, if you uh, accept and, and love your younger son, then what is my place here? And that's a terrible family to think about, but Jesus was talking about that as a spiritual family. That people who have been honoring God in public all their lives sometimes uh, fail of appreciation. The person who God's grace has called them away from a wasted life, from a failed life, and wants to celebrate the discovery of a life in the family of God. And the people uh, are good people, they're church people, at least they were in Jesus' day. And they said, I'm not coming to the party. You can have that baptism, Pastor. I'm not going to bother attending that baptism. I've got other things to do. And so when you find that church members don't even appreciate the saving of the lost, how can we have Jesus' joy be full, who is represented by the Father in this story? The Father is asking that the, the people who have been loyal, apparently up till now, appreciate the recovery of the lost. And the question is, do we value the recovery of the lost when it comes to people. Lastly, last points I have to make here. Jesus said, I came to cast fire on the earth. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. What in the world is Jesus talking about? Well, just what does it mean to cast fire on the earth? Why hasn't it been kindled already? He wishes it were already kindled. It hadn't been kindled when he said it. And so I'm going to suggest that we apply, apply the law of first mention because God has kindled fire on this earth before. And so if Jesus is going to cast fire on the earth, 
there should be a, a record of God casting fire on the earth and what was the consequences of that. So we ask, what, is, what kindled the first fire God cast upon the earth? Abel also brought out the firstborn of his flock of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, we have to look about that respect to God. It doesn't say anything about fire, but there's something about intuitively, we understand it was very visible to Cain and Abel immediately if God respected their offering. We're left to conclude that in the first sequence of offerings before the flood, God wanted to give encouragement to worshipers who were overwhelmed by their sense of sin. And as they uh, would kill a lamb and they would offer it, was it even accepted by God? Or was it a wasted effort? And God's part of the bargain appears to have been to send fire from heaven to burn up that offering. Now we know that because in the Elijah test, that was what was put to the test then, that if God was going to accept the offering of the people, the fire would come from heaven. They wouldn't set it themselves. And so there's a sort of a hearkening back to this, to something they knew that this would be an authentic way to tell if God has accepted the offering and the true God would be the one that had the power to do that. So we're looking at this, although there is no mention in Genesis of fire coming down, we have this idea that Cain knew immediately, Abel knew immediately, God had accepted one and not accepted the other. And fire gets sent again. This time we see it at the Tower of Babel in the shine iron. <coughs> it appears that Shem's family, the righteous, were praying because it seemed like the whole world was in opposition to the worship of true God and they knew that a one world religion and a political empire fused together was going to be the death knell for those who worship God. And they asked God to intervene because they didn't have the manpower to win that kind of a war. And so God comes down to inspect the, if that prayer was correct. And, he, and when he saw that Shem's family had maybe underestimated the level of this rebellion, he struck the tower's top with lightning, with fire, toppled it to the ground. And in consequence, what happened to the language? It was scrambled. Now I want you to watch something because there is fire coming again in Jesus' generation. There's one at the giving of the law and once again as the law is given, there's fire and lightning, but it is up to Acts 7.53 that says that law was given because of the prayers, the disposition, King James Version says, the disposition of angels. They're pleading with God, God, get a law because uh, there's too much wickedness is happening so fast, even among your people. And so now it, we ask you, did Jesus get a chance in your incarnational mission to bring fire on the earth? Well, John the Baptist tells prophetically, when Jesus came to be baptized, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I have is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. So we're looking for, did Jesus ever get a chance to baptize his people with the Holy Spirit and with fire? And we look to Acts 2, he's just ascended. And he had, was looking forward this whole time, but it didn't happen when he was on earth, but it was because he came to earth that... <coughs> On the day of Pentecost, 10 days after he had gone back to heaven, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rush, mighty rushing wind, the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and sat upon each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so we find here is now this fire is undoing the fire at Babel. It's allowing all people of any tongue to hear the gospel as though it was their own. We have an undoing of the Tower of Babel and it's doing so that God can build a kingdom on this earth of people ready to meet Jesus in peace. So I'm not gonna mention this one, but if you thought about the unquenchable fire in Luke 3, 17. I just want to make the comment, this is at the end of the age. This is not at his first mission. And uh, we need to be today praying for the fire that cancels our sin, consumes our chaff and our dross, so that we might live a life that glorifies God, that his holiness, and by beholding it, more and more we become like him 
in that same sense of virtue rather than vice, in that same sense of holiness rather than worldliness, that we become more and more like the one who came here to save us and reveal to us the saving love of his Father.